Amen. This is sort of a Father's Day message. Uh, turn to the book of Proverbs, if you would. In fact, uh, turn to those places in Proverbs. Kind of hold your hand there or your bookmarks or your bulletin or whatever. And if you look at the beginning of the book of Proverbs, you'll see that this is a man. We know it's Solomon, but just it could be any, any one of us men. It could be me, Brian, it could be you, Jim, it could be you, it could be any one of us men who would, if, uh, if we felt led to sit down and write things to our family, and to our children, our grandchildren, this would be something that we would write. In uh, Proverbs chapter 1, um, verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> that in this world, the father teaches them, but the mama's got the law. Amen. And if mama says it's this way, it's this way. That's what he's saying here. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Why is that? It's because mother's usually holding a wooden spoon. That's the law. Amen. Uh, for they shall be ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. And, and I want you to think about this. This is instructions now that any father, any father, give to his son. And let me say this. Uh, we, have, we have some people in our church that uh, have not had children of their own. And in a church... I've learned this over the years. Um, I had in this church growing up several spiritual fathers. I had men that I looked up to, men that I admired. One of them was Brother Dale McCurry. Dale McCurry, in my opinion, was one of the most godly, humble, loving uh, deacons, men, man of God that I think I've ever known in my life. And uh, believe it or not, as good as that man was, we had a contentious time here in our church uh, years ago, back when I was about 12 years old. That would have been about 1978, 79, somewhere around in there. And uh, we had one of a Jezebel women club that in a business meeting, while Brother Dale was standing up in favor of the pastor, this woman got up and slapped him across the face in the church. In a meeting. And her husband just sat there and let her do it. Whew. But it was men like that that I looked up to. Men, preachers that we had come through here. Uh, even visiting preachers, revival preachers and such. These men that I looked up to and they were spiritual fathers to me. Not just the preachers, but just some of the men that I really admired and I really looked up to. Uh, I mentioned to um, somebody this morning that does not go to church here anymore. When her father came to church here, she sent me a little note saying Happy Father's Day. And I told her, I said, your dad was one of those men that I, that I admired, that I looked to, that I got wise counsel from in the time that he was here. And so all of you men in this church really do have a responsibility um, over the children and the young men and the young ladies in this church. That's biblical. There's actually portions of the New Testament where Paul says to the aged men to uh, teach the younger men, to the aged women to teach the younger women and so on. He didn't just say their mothers do it. He said the, the women do it. The men do it. And you have a responsibility. This is why I, I try to encourage and preach and emphasize so much that your life outside of this Sunday morning service probably matters as much or more to the young people in this church than you just sitting here now. Because if you go out of this church during the week and make a fool of yourself, make an idiot of yourself in sin and everything like that and will not give it over to the Lord... I'm telling you, that sits in a young man's mind. And a young man goes home at night and he prays, God, why did that man do that? 
God, that man was my Sunday school teacher. He was, I, I loved him. Why did he do that? Why did he leave? I'm telling you, it makes a difference. And so this is about um, passing it down. And so he says in verse 10, My son of sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Why should us older men tell the younger men to don't listen to sinners? Because we did. And they lied. And they led us down a road that if it wasn't for God's grace, we would have never come back out of it. So he say, if they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us look privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall all fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us and let us all have one purse. Underline verse 14. Now I'm going to preach politics for about two minutes. Proverbs 1, 14 is a cry from God against liberalism, socialism, and communism. Do not believe the lie that rich people are rich because they're stealing all the money from the poor people. That is a communist ploy. And communism, let me tell you what communism really is all about. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Communism is about the people in the government having all of your money to spend. The money that you worked 8, 10, 12 hours a day to earn. It's about them taking it from you and spending it for themselves and on themselves. And they do. Amen to that. And so they want to try to convince you that a socialist, communist America is the best way to go. Well, we have poor people and it's not fair that they don't have what rich people have. Earn it! There's a man in this church right now. I'm not going to give his name because I'm not going to toot his horn. He has an eighth grade education. He practically raised himself for a few years on an old farm. Finally moved to the St. Louis area. Went and got a job. Worked hard every day. Married a woman, raised a family, and has done well for himself in his life. And he didn't have the government do it for him. He didn't complain that somebody else made billions of dollars and he didn't make billions of dollars. He didn't believe that somebody else should give him all his money while he sat home and did nothing except play video games. He said, if I want what I want, I'm going to go out and work for it and earn it. And that way you take care of it. There may be a couple of men. There may be three or four men in this church like that. There may be several of you like that. And I hope there is. I hope there is to teach a younger generation. It's not going to be handed to you. And if it is handed to you, I guarantee you there's a string that can take it back if they want. Well, that's good preaching. Amen. You teach your children not to be communist, socialist, and not to even favor that junk. That's not what America is all about. Never should be. All right, I'm done with that. Well, maybe I'm done with that. Now, Proverbs 13, verse 22. A good man, listen to this now. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. A, a while before my grandmother died, my dad's mom, Mima. She took my mom through their house and she would pick up, she would go in the closet and reach up there and pull out an old coffee can, take the lid off and she'd show mom there's money in there, put the lid back on it and stick it back in the closet. She'd go over to a vase, and pull the, the plastic flowers out of that vase and she would tip it over and show mom now there's money down in that vase. 
She put it back in there. She walked all through that house and showed my mama where all the cash that she had laid back for. And my mama said, who's that for? And she said, when I die, I want that to go to all the grandkids. So we ended up with what, about $500 a piece? Melissa's shaking her head like she got more and she just didn't tell me. <laughs> nah. But she laid back, she was a good woman and she laid back for her grandchildren. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children, children, and the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. Now, here's what I'm going to teach you this morning. There's more than just money to leave behind for your children and your grandchildren. More than just money. In fact, the way things are now, I, we've seen it so many times. People get, people get a thirty, forty thousand, hundred thousand dollar inheritance, and you know what the first thing that a lot of them do with it? Go to the casino. They go to the boat and lose it just like that. Because they've gotten high on that feeling thinking maybe they can get it back, they go out into the lobby to one of them loan machines that are supposed to be illegal, but we voted them in, Congress voted them in, and they can go and take out a loan there at the casino so they can go back in and spend all that loan money. It's, it's a trap, people. Don't fall for it. But there's a lot of things that parents especially us dads, are supposed to leave behind for our children. You go in my office, there's a whole wall dedicated to my dad and the work that he did. I love the work that he did. If God hadn't called me to preach, that's where I'd have been. But on the other wall of that is a great big 11-point buck deer. It wasn't my mom that taught me how to shoot one of those things. It wasn't my sister that taught me how to shoot one of those things. And I didn't have YouTube to teach me anything back then. It was my father that taught me how to shoot one of those things. And by 16 years old, I'd had my first eight-point buck out at, uh, um, what's that military army base there? P uh, Fort Leonard Wood. That was Dad's favorite place to hunt. And we'd do a special hunt out at Fort Leonard Wood. And Dad taught me how to not just shoot it. But what to do if it didn't fall dead right then and there? And it didn't. It walked away and I couldn't believe it because I thought, man, I had the gun right on it. And so I did what my dad said to do. I waited about 15 minutes. I climbed down out of that tree. I walked over there where I knew that he was and uh, didn't really see a whole lot. So I went back to the truck. Dad told me to honk three times. I honked three times. Dad come out of the woods. I said, what's the matter? I said, Dad, I think I got one. He said, well, when you shot, did it jump up in the air? And I said, yeah. As he said, it wasn't celebrating. He said, you got him. He said, let's, let's go over there. He said, you didn't walk around, did you? And I said, no, I did what you told me to do. I came back and got you. And had I tried to track that deer, I would have run him off. I gut shot him. And they run on adrenaline. And had I tried to... To, to track him right then and there, I would have missed that thing. And Dad, within when we walked over to the spot, Dad, in about 10 minutes, found that thing laying there. And when he opened it up, blood just came gushing out of his belly. I know that's not what a lot of people want to hear, but that's life. That cheeseburger you had last week, somebody had to gut that thing, amen? <laughs> but he taught me how to do that. So I decided it'd be right to teach my boys how to do it. And doggone it, I didn't just teach my boys. I taught my first daughter how to do it. She killed her first doe a couple years ago behind the house. Amen. And you know what? Now I'm taking my grandsons into the deer blind with me. Because I want them to inherit the knowledge that my dad gave me about being able to kill a deer and feed your family with it. Teaching my granddaughter how to shoot an AR-15 with pleasure. Amen. Shoot a 12 gauge and be able to take the kickback that it gives you and turn around and shoot it again. That's what you're supposed to be doing with your grandkids, not teaching them how to smoke, how to drink liquor. Not teaching them that it's okay to go to the dispensary and get drugs. Not teaching them that it's okay to steal. That it's okay to lie. 
that if you get in trouble with the cops, well, I'm going to raise such a fuss and, and those cops will be scared of me and I'll get you out of it and all this. That's not what we're supposed to be teaching our kids. We're supposed to be teaching our kids that laws, if you break laws, you get in trouble for breaking laws. And if you ever break the law, don't call me from jail and ask me for bail money because I'm not bailing you out. Proverbs 17, 6, children's children are the crown of old men. And the glory of children are their fathers. Do you see that? Our glory and our crown is our grandchildren. The glory of your children and their grandchildren are their fathers and their grandfathers. My grandfather, my dad's dad is the only one I knew. And I loved him as much as I, or more as I loved anybody in this world. I loved that man. And um, God finally taught me enough in the ministry to be able to go down and preach his funeral. That was tough. But God, through him, was teaching me how to take my own family members and lay them gently in the ground and ask God to come get them in the resurrection. Somebody say amen. Father, we ask your blessings on this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> I, I want you to understand this is not just good advice. I don't, I don't teach good advice. The Bible doesn't teach good advice. It is not a self-help manual. It is full of the commandments of God. When you follow the commandments of God, there is good things that happen in your life. When you deny the commandments of God, you will, you, you will struggle, you will fight, you will war, you will be full of bitterness, hatred, arrogance all of your life. To turn against the commandments of God is to turn against the way of your own heart. God has written His commandments in our heart. Do you think that we had to study some book somewhere that told us that it was wrong to take something that belonged to somebody else because the first time you ever stole something, you didn't do it in the midst of a crowd watching you. You waited until there was nobody looking your way and then you took it. Why? Because you knew it was wrong. To deny God's commandments is to deny God's law written in your hearts. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. He said, don't just hear it, do it. That it may be well with thee, and that they, ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt, this is where the first commandment comes from for us in this New Testament age. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And you know what? It's not, it's not unmanly. It's not a, being a sissy. It's not being a little girly man to let your children see you cry as you pray unto God and say, God have mercy on me, a sinner. There's nothing wrong with that. A whole generation of men grew up in this world being told that it was wrong to cry, wrong to show your emotions, but any emotion but anger. And it messed up a generation of children in this. And that's probably where the hippie generation came out of. Being dissatisfied at home. But there's nothing wrong with letting your children see you pray, letting your children see you read your Bible, letting your children see you live a Christian life. And there's nothing wrong with letting your children know that you've made mistakes, you've done stupid things. Things I've had to confess to my own children in order to help them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Watch this now, verse 6, here it is. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Notice, he did not say, thou shalt send them to a Christian school to be taught. He did not say that. It is not the government's job to raise 
your children any religion. If they do, it'll be in the religion of government, and you do not want that. This is not what our founding fathers fought and died for. This is not what the men at Omaha Beach jumped off to go after them Germans for. This is not the freedoms that was given to us and bled for and died for in this country to let the government be the religion of your children. Amen. Amen. It is your job to teach them how to be free children. So what do you mean by that? Any time the government hands out money, there's always going to be chains tied to it. And what happens is you get hooked on the money and all of a sudden you're chained. And when if the government says you can't do this, then you can't do this. And if the government says you can't do that, then you can't do that. We are not a 501c3 church in that the IRS cannot tell me what I can and cannot say. And if I feel like endorsing a political candidate, by cracky, I'm going to endorse one. And the IRS can't do anything about it. Um, verse 7, thou shalt, walk, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. That means it's your job to teach your children, not the Sunday school. To, I believe in Sunday school. And I believe you ought to bring your kids to Sunday school. I brought my children to Sunday school. Well, you're the pastor. I would have done it anyway. My mom brought me to Sunday school. Taught me how to come to Sunday school. What Sunday school? You ought to come find out. Well, Sunday school's for little kids, isn't it? I don't know. Brother Sterling, Sister Gloria sit there for Sunday school. They've been doing it ever since I've known them. It is not anybody else's responsibility to teach your children the Bible, the Word of God, how to act, how to live, how to be. It is your primary responsibility. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house. Look at that. When you're, when you're in your house. He didn't say, now, now wait till the preacher preaches on this. He'll tell it to you. No, you do it. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou rise, risest up. In other words, the Word of God is always a part of your life. And your children know this. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. That means that you and your neighbor, your neighbors call you that crazy Baptist that lives next door to us. That crazy Bible thumper thinks they got to put, I hate them people that got to think they got to put Bible verses all over their house. Put them on there, amen. Maybe the only Bible your neighbors ever read. Somebody hang up on their front porch a big John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, amen. Just maybe, just maybe. One of your neighbors will say, you know what? I've been thinking about going to church. I think I'm going to stop there and find out where they go to church. Teach it to your children first. Your children are your first mission field. Your grandchildren are your mission field. Your stepchildren are your mission field. And we live in an age right now, forgive me for bringing this up, but we live in an age right now where stepchildren in this country are the most attacked people in this land. Who are they attacked by? Step parents. Physically, emotionally, sexually assaulted by men who are not their father, women who are not their mother. Now I'm not saying that that's evil in itself, I'm just saying if you're a stepdad, you let them see Jesus in you. If you're a stepmom, you let them see Jesus in you. Amen? Psalm 103, turn there. This morning I've only got 20 verses instead of 25, so I'm really moving on. You've got to get down the road. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. And you know what, dads? That should be the way you should be. 
Instead of having a dad that flies off the handle every, every time something happens, Where, where's my screwdriver? I, used to, I put my screwdriver here every time and somebody, I'm going to tell you what, I want to tear somebody's head off that I find that screwdriver. Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to, slow, he's slow to anger. Aren't you glad God's slow to anger? Because if God would have been quick, you'd have been in hell already. He will not always chide, will he? Chide means to yell at them, scream at them, fuss at them. A father or a mother that's constantly fussing at their children, constantly berating them, constantly belittling them. You don't love them. Not the way God does. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. In other words, God has not given us what we deserved, has he? No. Nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Now, this is it. now we, we all know this verse. We've heard this. Yeah, he scattered our sins as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. Well, yeah, let me ask you a question. Dads, have you done that with your children's sin, your son's sins, your daughter's sins, your daughter, your stepdaughter's sins, your stepson's sins? Have you done that with their sins? Remember the rule that Jesus taught us in the prayer that he taught us to pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's what, that's what the real Christianity teaches. That's what a real macho man will do. Is that when his son sins or his daughter gets in trouble... He will remind himself of his own sinfulness. Now, that doesn't mean let him get away with it. But it does mean that if they want forgiveness, you can forgive them. Like as a father, look at this verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children. Isn't that something? So the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. Now I come in, sometimes I come in my office and I see that my candy bucket is down on the floor. And a trail of wrappers leading out my office. What that means is somebody's got in there and stole some candy from me. Now it makes me mad. And I say, who's been stealing my candy? You know, I want to, and I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I just want them to think I'm mean. Who's stealing my candy? And let them hear it. And I'll pick the trash up, put the bucket up on a shelf where right now they can't reach it. Although I did teach Cheeseburger how to climb up there the other day. He's pretty good at it. Does that mean they're never, ever, 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 ever going to get another piece of candy again? No. No. Because I know their frame. I know how children are made. I know not to expect a whole lot out of them. I know not to expect perfection out of any of them. Because perfection only belongs to God. And perfection doesn't even belong to their father or their mother. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth, for the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Upon, watch this now. Upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Here's, now here's what this means. Okay, Ron, let's say that you're in the flower of your life right now. Okay, you've got children, you've got grandchildren, you've got a wife, you've got friends, you've served your country, you're a proud American, uh, you're doing good things, and, and so on and so on. And you're able, to do, you're able to do things, you're able to keep doing those things, okay? So you are still in the flower of your life, you are still productive, as it were. 
But a time comes when everything in the body breaks down and it doesn't work anymore. And then eventually we'll either linger away and just slowly pass away or we'll die suddenly, but then we'll die. And then they will bury you. They will put flowers on your grave and eventually those flowers will die as well. Your family will come visit you every week and then they'll come visit you every month and then they'll come visit you maybe every year. And then after a while, nobody's coming to visit you. You're just a grave in the graveyard. However, even though you're not here anymore, you can leave behind in your family what does he say the mercy of the lord is from everlasting to everlasting they can talk i talk of a grandfather that i never knew it's my mom's dad he died when she was five and you know what he was a king james bible southern baptist preacher and i didn't know that for a long time i came from a preacher man. And that blesses my heart. That thrills me to know that that's in my blood. It's in my ancestry. And I think of that man. I've, I've got a picture of him now. And I just, I like to hear stories. that When my aunt came, I wanted to hear a little bit more about what he was like. And so on and so on. A little bit know about him. Why? Because he's not dead as long as I still got him in here and got him in here. And the, thing, the way that he lived his life and the things that he did, he, from what I hear, he messed up his life at early in life. But then the latter part of his life was redemption time. He wanted to try to make things right again. And God blessed him and he was able to do that. And the fact that I'm talking about him today, even though I never met him, is an example that he handed that down to me through the people that knew him to a grandson that he never knew, but I hope I'll see him in heaven one of these days. See, you're always going to leave something behind, aren't you? And what, if, what, if all you give to your children and grandchildren is money, that's going to be gone quickly, I can tell you that. But if you leave behind those good things in life, like teaching them how to do things, teaching them how to live, teaching them, how to, teaching them when to speak and teaching them when to keep their mouth shut, then you've taught them something. Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord and that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. What are we concerned about right now? That our grandchildren are going to have to face some very, very bad times, aren't we? Are we worried about that? I am. My goodness, I'm worried about that. But I believe the Bible. And I'm going to try to live my life and pray and study God's word and be an example, a fit example of a father, of a husband, of a grandfather, of a pastor, of a man. So that maybe, just maybe, I'll get to see in my grandchildren and even in maybe in my great grandchildren that there's still peace in America. Because maybe there's going to come a time when there won't be. Exodus 34, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Dads, it is your job, number one, to make sure that justice is done. And if your children get too far out of line, they need to know that if you said something and you're going to do it, that you meant business. Else, they'll play you as the fool 
all the days of your life. Well, Dad said he wouldn't bail me out, but he bailed me out six times already. If you told your children, don't call you, you'd never bail them out of jail, don't bail them out of jail. Maybe there won't be a second time. I know that one I know that Steve told me, my brother in law told me the fact that had he had to linger in jail is what caused him to really get serious and start calling on the name of the Lord. Because he ran up against a God that wasn't just gonna bend for him every time he did something wrong. And just five days before he left this world, he's in my office saying, Mike, make, t tell me once again, I want to make sure I'm going to heaven when I die. That was God being abundant in goodness and truth and keeping mercy and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But then visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. I'm going to give you one example of this and I'm going to let you go. There was a man by the name of Achan. The first city that God told Israel to attack was going to be Jericho. Jericho was a defiled city. There's no telling what all disease was rampant in there. And God told the Israelites, when you go in there, you're going to kill every man, woman, and child. You're going to kill all the cattle. You're going to kill uh, all the people. You're not going to take their clothes. You're not going to take their gold or their idols. You're not going to take anything that belongs to them. I want you to keep your hands off it. I want that city burnt. I want it destroyed. Everybody in the army of Israel kept the Lord's word except one man. Achan. And Joshua went out presumptuously to the next city. It was Ai and went up against it and lost a bunch of men. He came back crying to God. God, what happened? I don't know. God said, you went up presumptuously. You didn't even ask me. And besides, there's sin in the camp. And you need to find out what it is and where it is before I bless you again. So Joshua called all the Israelites together. And he said, there's sin in this camp. I want to know who did it. I want to know what they did. Bring it forth now. Nobody did anything. So they took all the men, the, the heads of each tribe, and they cast lots to, to the families of their tribes. And when they had found a particular family, they went down this line and this line and this line until finally the lot fell upon Achan. God was using whatever the lot was, if you picture it as dice or dominoes or whatever, Whatever it was, it wasn't random chance that selected Achan. It was God directing it so that it pointed it right to Achan. And Joshua looked at Achan and said, Achan, what hast thou done? He said, I took a wedge of gold and a Babylonian garment. I don't remember what all else he took. And they said, go to his tent and find it. And they went to his tent. And he had it buried. And I'm going, what good does it do to steal it if you've got to bury it and hide it from everybody? So he hid it and buried it. And they dug it up and brought it forth. And then Joshua said, now go get his family. They went and got Achan's wife and his children. And they stood Achan and his wife and his children. And Joshua said, they are all to die. Because of his sin. Now imagine you're Achan. And you're looking at the son that you love. And you're watching them as the crowd is throwing big rocks at your eight-year-old son. And watching his head become crushed in blood under the weight of those rocks. You see him falling upon his lifeless body, blood coming out. You see your wife in, in tears 
and the stones are just taking her life away. And then you see your little three-year-old daughter and they're killing her and they're crushing her with stones. The last thing that you see in this world is your family suffering for your sins. And the whole point of that story, God is telling you, was it worth it? Is there any sin that's worth making your grandchildren suffer for what you did? And the answer is no. Not if you love them. We've had a miscarriage. A five-week-old daughter that we knew was going to die, that died. And all I could think of was, was that because of me? Did God take her life because of what I did? I'll never know the answer to that until I get with God. But carrying the thought of it, some days is hard to bear. I don't want my children or my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren to have to suffer for the things that I did. I don't want them to inherit my wickedness down to the third and fourth generation. What I want them to inherit is a dad that has mercy, a grandpa that has mercy, a man that has mercy because I want them to know that we have a heavenly father that is full of mercy. But he's also just. And if God said he'll punish it. He'll punish it. Let's bow our heads. Father, if, if there's ever a time machine built, I want to be the first one in it. Because I want to go back. And... Make myself not do some of the things that I've done. I want to go back in time and warn myself. Mike, don't do that. The consequences you won't like. But Father, I recognize now that all of those same warnings that I would go back and tell myself they were already written in your word. And I just didn't listen. So Father, the best lessons I've learned in life, I learned them the same way my dad did, the same way his dad did, and so on and so on, is that we learned them the hard way. We learn them by making horrible mistakes, foolish mistakes, things that should have never been done, should have never been said, places should have never been in, people we should have never been with. It was just foolishness. But Father, now what I want having learned your forgiveness and your mercy, is I want my sons to know that mercy and that forgiveness. I want my daughters to know that mercy and forgiveness. I also want them to know what I tried to teach them is that if dad said no, dad meant no. If mom said no, mom meant no. And if God says don't, 
That means don't. I want my grandchildren to learn that. I want them to teach that to their children. If Jesus tarries his coming. And Father, as grandparents, grandmas, and grandpas, we're still not done influencing our children and our children's children. In fact, at our age and even older, Lord, that it seems like the job just kicks in. Because they, they love grandma and they love grandpa. And they'll listen to us. So God put it in us to teach them the things that they need to know about God, about Jesus, about this world, about sin, about things that we did back when we were young and how the world really isn't all that different now. Same sin that's now is the same sin that was then. And Lord, help us to pass down, just like our will and testament. We give them so much money, give them a part of the property, give them some of the things that they wanted, that we had in our life, just like those things we would hand down to our children. Father, help us to hand down the important things, like they need to be saved. Hell is real and it's forever. But God's heaven is for real and it's better. God teaches how to put those as our will and our testimony of what we want and how we want our children to remember us. And how we want our grandchildren to remember us. So that they would pass it down to theirs and so on and so on. Father, I don't personally know of a family that's had ten generations live successfully for you in their life. But Father, if there is, and if it's possible, I sure would like it to be my family, and I sure would like it to be these people's family as well. So Father, give us that grace. And give us the desire, Lord. To let our children inherit nothing but the best that we have to give. Bless us this morning. Thank you, God, for speaking to us. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Would you stand to your feet?